Hello everyone, welcome to another, another video of physics. In today's video, we are going to be solving a, a cool problem I thought up. It's to find the equation of motion for a mass that is attached to a spring on an inclined plane with friction. So let's begin. So basically, we have some mass that's mounted onto some pole with a spring. And basically, initially, the spring is not stretched. It's at its natural extension. And then we let the mass fall down. And as the mass falls down the ramp, the spring will start to stretch. And that's going to cause a retarding force acting this way. That's fighting the force of gravity that's acting this way. And basically, these forces are going to be battling each other. And we want to find out what the overall motion of the mass is going to look like. So, and we also have friction on top of that, acting in the direction of the spring force. So, using our intuition, we already know that this is probably going to be oscillatory motion here. Because, think about it like physically, if a ball is falling down a ramp attached to a spring, what's going to happen is that like, at some distance here, it's going to like, go back up again pretty much but if the mass is large enough we can imagine the force of gravity will be large enough such that it can finally go fully down the ramp without being drawn back up again by the spring but to confirm this with the math you have to actually solve the equation of motion for this block so here i've drawn a free body diagram of the block going down the ramp we have the normal force acting in the vertical direction. We have the force of gravity, the force of the spring, or the spring force, and the force of friction. Now, a good thing to note here is that since this mass is not gonna go in this direction, you know that, that, that the normal force equals the y component of gravity. And this means that it's beneficial to orient our coordinate system such that the x direction is in the direction of the ramp, and then y is the normal direction. So basically, to solve the equations of motion for the system, we want to focus on the x direction, since that's the direction where there will be a non-trivial equation of motion. So we just have to, have to use f equals ma, pretty much. So that's what's just going to come out to being mgx minus the force of friction. So fk minus the spring force that's going in this direction. That's going to be kx due to Hooke's law. And that's going to equal ma. All right. So what's fk? Well, fk is going to be mu k times the normal force, or mu k is the coefficient of friction. And the normal force is just going to be mg cosine of theta. And hopefully you guys, you guys, you guys can convince yourselves of that. And then this means that fk is going to be mu k mg cosine of theta. And this means that our equation just becomes mgx. Oh, also mgx, what's that going to be? Well, mgx is going to be mg times the sine of theta. And you guys can also convince, convince, convince yourself of that. So then minus mu k mg cosine theta minus kx equals ma. And basically what we've done is we said that the net force acting in the x direction equals the mass times acceleration. So now what we can do is we can divide both sides by the mass. So the masses will cancel out on this side and this side. And we'll have a, mi a, a divide by m on this side. Meaning that our acceleration is just g sine of theta minus mu k g cosine of theta minus kx over m, which is just this over here. If you can go, go ahead and define some constant called omega, where omega squared equals k over m, which means that omega is the square root of k over m. Meaning that we can write this part over here as omega squared. So now what we can do is we can note that the acceleration is just the second derivative of the position. 
So our differential equation becomes, what we can do now is we can define this thing over here. This is gonna be a constant, okay? So we can define this as like, let's just call it M, big M, which means that the second derivative of X with, re with respect to T equals minus omega squared X plus M. So we can immediately notice here that if M is going, to, if M is zero, right? We simply have a homogeneous second order differential equation. And we know that this looks like wave motion. So this is an, an equation for some sort of oscillating uh, object. But we have a source of M here. So our actual equation is going to equal M instead of zero, making this a non-homogeneous differential equation. So how can we solve what this is going to be? Well, we can use some clever arguments here. So let's say that we just had a simpler differential equation, this one over here. So to solve this equation, we want it to look like the homogeneous differential equation. So we want it to look like this. And to do that, we can do a change of coordinates. We can define some variable x prime, where x prime is x minus m. This means that x is x prime plus m. So we have the second derivative of x prime plus m plus x prime plus m minus m equals zero. And this is just going to be a second derivative of x prime with respect to t plus x prime equals zero. And that's our that's a homogeneous differential equation. And this the solution to this is just going to be a sine of t plus b cosine of t. So since x is x prime plus m, this means that x is just going to be this over here plus t. And that's how we can solve this differential equation. Not plus t actually, plus m. So that's our answer. So we don't have this equation exactly. What we have is a plus omega squared in front, which will make this a little bit more complicated, but it's not going to be too bad. So we can do the same trick as before. We want to find some u coordinate x prime, where x prime is just x minus something. So x, some new letter w, which means that x equals x prime plus w. So we're going to have the second derivative of x prime plus w plus omega squared. Ooh, we have w and omega. That's that's not good. Let's use a different letter. Let's use b, okay? b. So x prime plus b, and then plus omega squared, and then x prime plus b minus m equals 0. So basically, we want... Um, this m to go away pretty much so how can we make this m go away well if we were to define b as m over omega squared what happens is that we'll have this equation over here so plus omega squared x prime plus m over omega squared minus m equals zero. Distributing this, we'd have omega squared x prime, and then we'll have this. And this is indeed zero. So defining this, uh, defining b like that does end up working out, which means that x prime, or sorry, yeah, x prime of t is going to be um, a sine of omega t plus b cosine of omega t. And that implies that x of t, well, what we want to find, will just be a sine of omega t plus b cosine of omega t, and then plus m over omega squared, because plus b. So that's our solution to our equation. And we can note that again, omega, was what square root of k over m, which means that omega squared is k over m, 
which means that this is over here is just small m over k. And that means that and then m again was that big thing solution to our equation. So we can see some things that are familiar here. We see that uh, oscillatory motion with the sinusoids. And then we can see where the friction comes in. That's the mu k over here. And then we see where the force, force of gravity comes in, the mg over here. As our mass gets larger, x of t is going to be greater because this is like a plus, right? So let's go all the way back here to our picture over here. We can see that this is our x direction along the ramp. So here's x equals zero at the start of it. And if we just had the also tray motion by itself, like x of three might be this point over here on the ramp. But since we have this plus factor over here, it's going to be boosted even further along the ramp. And this essentially just means that as our mass approaches infinity, as it gets bigger and bigger, our object will fall down faster. And that makes sense because of the friction. No, not because of the friction, because of the spring force. The spring force is sensitive to mass. Mass will actually matter for the spring force. And we can see that as the spring constant goes to infinity, what happens is that this part becomes pretty neg neg negligible, which makes sense. If the spring is like more rigid, well, what's going to happen is that it's going to like the, the object is not going to fall as much, if that makes sense, because the spring force will be much stronger than the force of gravity. So terms involving the force of gravity are going to be neg negligible. So we can see that there is, is of course, the os oscillatory motion that we expected along with this factor over here. If we did not have any friction at all, so if mu k was just zero, this yellow dagger represents that there's friction, by the way. So if mu k was zero, what would happen is that this would just uh, go away and we would just have mg sine of theta over k. And we can see that this friction term it's a like retarding effect. Like as this gets bigger, X of T is not boosted as much. So the particle is gonna slow down pretty much. So yeah, that is our solution. If we want, want to graph this thing out, it will look like this, where here's X and here's T, because this is a constant. So it just shifts up vertically by the amount of the constant pretty much. And then for A and B, we can just like, those are arbitrary constants. We can let, like, we can let B be zero and A be one if we'd like, and we'd have this equation. So yeah, thanks for watching. And that's how you solve the equations of motion for a particle on a spring going down a ramp with friction. See you guys next time. Bye.